Edwin Black, our speaker today, is an award-winning New York Times best-selling author and investigative journalist. His books, which include at least 10 bestsellers, have appeared in 14 different languages in 65 different countries. His articles have appeared in leading publications in the United States, Europe, and Israel, and he has been interviewed on hundreds of network broadcasts from Oprah, The Today Show, CNN's Wolf Blitzer Reports, and NBC Dateline, and that's just in the United States. He's also been on shows in Europe and Latin America. The book he'll be discussing today, IBM and the Holocaust, was first published in 2001, and now what we're featuring today is the launch of the revised, expanded edition in the book, Mr. Black describes the business dealings of IBM with the government of Adolf Hitler in the 1930s and the years of World War II. And as you will hear today, in the book, Mr. Black details how IBM's technology helped facilitate the Nazi genocide. For his initial work on IBM and the Holocaust, Mr. Black assembled a team of more than 100 researchers, translators, and assistants to work on the discovery and analysis of primary source materials written in German, French, and Polish. In all, more than 20,000 20, documents from 50 different libraries, archives, museums, and other collections were reviewed and analyzed in the writing of this book. Edwin Black epitomizes the constant quest for justice, just like Aaron did. He balances his passion with reason. He educates himself and the rest of us so that each and every one of us can understand the facts and then speak for justice. His work focuses on genocide and hate, corporate criminality and corruption, governmental misconduct, academic fraud, philanthropic abuse, and oil addiction and alternative energy. Edwin Black has devoted his life to exposing injustice, and he seeks through his writings and his speeches to educate and promote justice. It, he is therefore the perfect person to inaugurate our Gems for Justice lecture series. And so without further ado, I present to you the AAJLJ's first Gem for Justice, Edwin Black. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. I know some of you have come from far away, like uh, Annie, who has come from Arizona, and Eve, who has come all the way from Brooklyn. Uh, I'd like to uh, say we're here for the global launch of the expanded edition of IBM and the Holocaust. The book appeared uh, first some 10 years ago in, in February of 2001 on a single day in 40 countries in nine languages adjusted for time zone. They all came out at the same minute and all the newspapers and TV came out at the same minute. And that was so that IBM couldn't stop us. Over 1.2 million copies of the book is sold worldwide, and you can't get any anymore. Uh, there are a few dozen straggled copies left on a few straggled Barnes and Noble bookshelves here and there, but there are none more really to order. So we decided that the next edition would be an expanded edition. You've heard about my 20,000 documents. Some 32 pages of those documents, if not more, uh, have been published in this, expand, in this expanded edition. And the purpose of that is, although the book is meticulous in quoting the um, clear and conscious collusion between IBM and the Third Reich, it's in 600 pages of text. And it's amazing what happens when you actually see the documents, the internal IBM correspondence, the government memos, the photographs, 
and understand exactly how eager IBM was to assist the Third Reich in the Holocaust. So what are we talking about? Uh, and before I get into the bulk of my remarks, I would like to say that this, um, uh, uh, this event is being broadcast globally uh, by a half a dozen internet sites, including the Auto Channel, and I give a big salute out to Mark Rausch, who flew in from California to tape this. It's at History Network News. It's at um, uh, Spiro Forum, the Cutting Edge News. Dot com, and it's at IBM and the Holocaust dot com. So it's not just the people in this room who are listening at this moment. It's people everywhere. And I know that there are people right this moment in Argentina and in Israel and Australia who are listening. They, like you, will get a chance to ask questions at the end. So instead of the questions just being limited to the people seated here, I will take questions from anywhere on the, on the planet. If you are out there uh, in other countries or other cities uh, and you have a question, go to ibmandtheholocaust.com and click the button that says Ask Edwin. Um, I will get it here and I will try to answer your question live in front of, every, in front of everyone. If you hit that same Ask Ed, Ed, Edwin tomorrow, it will say, I'm sorry, Mr. Black will not answer you for a year. <laughs> but if you hit it now, I'll try to get to it. Um, after my event, I'm going to um, go to the back and autograph any books for anyone who wants them from either this edition or my other editions. If we run out, don't worry, there's more. Uh, and uh, the books have been pre-positioned all over the world um, at the major retailers. If you go to Amazon.com, you will not see a copy of the book, but we have the secret links. They're all at IBM and the Holocaust.com in England, in Australia, in Italy, in Estonia, everywhere. Now let's get to the subject uh, that brings us here. <clears throat> I first discovered IBM's involvement with the Third Reich when my parents and I visited the Holocaust Museum. My, uh, the, the story of my parents is well known. My uh, mom was pushed out of a train on the way to Treblinka. Uh, she was um, uh, from that little window and uh, she was known as a jumper and uh, she was buried in a mass grave and my uh, father was a partisan and he uh, saw her legs sticking out of the snow and uh, they lived together uh, uh, for two years in the woods. So when I brought my parents to the Holocaust Museum for the first time, which is like many people they didn't want to go, the first thing you saw when you went to the Holocaust Museum was the IBM machine. And they said, IBM Holocaust does not compute. What is that? because everyone thinks of computers. So it took me, I promised I would get to the bottom of it, and I assembled a team of researchers, and we went all over the world, and we scoured the archives, and we slowly put together exactly why that machine was in the Holocaust Museum. Even the Holocaust Museum didn't know why it was there. It's not there anymore, but it was there when the picture was taken that's in my book. Now, what we discovered was that IBM consciously co-planned and co-organized all six phases of the Holocaust directly from its New York offices and later, through its subsidiaries and offices in Paris, in Sweden, in Switzerland, in Poland, all across Europe. And this was done under the minute-to-minute -minute micromanagement of Thomas J. Watson, its president. And when I say all six phases of the Holocaust, I mean the identification of the Jews, 
the expulsion from society, the confiscation of their assets, the ghettoization of the Jews, the deportation of the Jews, and even the extermination of the Jews. In fact, the Auschwitz tattoo began as an IBM number. Later, there were many other variations of that, but that's how it began. It was their IBM prisoner number. It was just tattooed on their arm. So let's try to understand how it worked and why it worked. When Hitler came to power and was determined to dismantle and destroy the Jews, he wanted to identify all the Jews and all their assets and get rid of them as best he could, as fast as he could. And it needed the resources of a computer. But there was no computer in 1933. What was there? Something that all of you are aware of? Punch cards. They called them Lochkarten, cards with holes in, in, in them. And the punch and the punch cards stored information on any process, individual or, or location, by the holes that were punched in columns in rows. And by passing them through a certain type of a reader, you could cross-tabulate that information to discover anything about an individual, a place, or a process. So really, IBM had the world's monopoly on information technology. And until IBM developed this system, Herman Hollerith developed it for them, for the American Census Bureau to track people. You could count on your hands and toes and take 10 years to count the census. Or you could use the IBM system to cross-tabulate information. Not only count the number of people in this room, but identify their location, where, the, where they live, what their profession is what their bank accounts are. That was the magic of information technology. And I know that there are people on the internet right now who think they know what information technology is. And they think that the information age was born in Silicon Valley. In fact, most people here in, within listening range of my voice do not know what the information age is. The information age is the individualization of statistics. Not only can I count you as a member of the crowd, I can individualize the information that I have about you. And the information age was invented not in Silicon Valley, but in Berlin in 1933. IBM at that time went to the Third Reich and said, we are the solutions company, and there's no solution we won't give you. So, they said, what do you want to know? He said, I want to know where the Jews are. Who are the Jews? Some of these guys are running around with hats and curls, and go into synagogues. And some of them are bankers. They're going to church. A Jew is not one who prays to the Jewish religion. A Jew is by blood, which of course they got from the Carnegie Institution, the Rockefeller Foundation, which told them that eugenically it was ras und blut, race and blood. You've all heard the term race and blood, invented not by Hitler, but 30 years before by the president of Stanford University, pioneer of the American eugenic movement. So Hitler said, I want to know where the Jews are. So IBM said, we'll invent the racial census. 
you'll know where all the Jews are. He said, we don't have the people that would be necessary to pull this off. I just got into power, etc. IBM said, we'll do it for you. We'll gather the machines, we'll hire the census takers, we'll do it as a project. So how did it work? Okay. They took a census with pencil and paper and then had thousands of people punching in the data. And they would ask the following questions and put them in the following columns. In one column they would put the religion, in the second column they would put the mother tongue, in the third column they would put the nationality, in the fourth column they would put the profession, in the fifth column they would put the, um, uh, the city. At the rate of 60,000 cards per hour, like that, they suddenly knew what they never knew before, that there were, they knew the location of every Polish Jew in Berlin engaged in the fur trade. Every Romanian Jew in Frankfurt engaged in the legal, in the legal profession. With that information, identification, which never ended with a single census and was constantly repeated in registrations in census. They then cross-tabulated that information with other tabulated materials. The marriage bureaus, the death bureaus, the bar association, the university directories, the journalism associations, the auto clubs, they had the original names, they added to them, then they cross-indexed them with these other groups, and now they could expel all the Jewish attorneys, all the Jewish doctors, all the Jewish judges, all the Jewish professors, like that. All right, so now we've identified the Jews, we're excluding them from society, we want their assets, not a problem. All the banks and savings and loans and financial institutions are organized on IBM punch cards. Cross-index all those names against the bank accounts and now you can aryanize, you can confiscate, you can pauperize, you can demand that corporations fire their Jewish employees or their stockholders, you can go after real estate. Okay? Fourth area, ghettoization. One day, at a given hour, all the Jews pick up from one side of town and they go to the other side of town. They leave their comfortable homes. Eight families into a, into a slum apartment. They have their orders. They know exactly what street to go to. They know the stairwell to go to. They know the apartment number. No confusion. Everybody's there in a day. How'd that happen? That's traffic management. That's the magic of what IBM can do. All right. Now we've got the Jews ghettoized. Next step, deportation by train. That's easy. All the trains in Europe ran on IBM punch cards. Polish railway, IBM punch cards. And I mean from the location at 22 Paviestrasse run by the man called Leon, who I interviewed. All the trains go into Auschwitz, 40 kilometers away full, they come back empty. It's deportation, now we go to the final aspect, extermination. 
IBM organized the extermination by labor program. That means that they were able to take one card and assess all of your skills. You were an auto, you were an auto mechanic, you were a bricklayer, you were an optician, you were a doctor, and they would match that to a work requirement at a slave camp and they would move Jews back and forth and back and forth until they were worked to death. And every Jew who moved across Europe from concentration to concentration camp was moved by the IBM system, <clears throat> the Hollerith system. Hollerith was the trade name of IBM in the same way that, um, uh, uh, that, that Macintosh is the trade name of Apple. And when they had been worked to death, they were gassed. And IBM had a code for that too. So happy was Adolf Hitler with Thomas Watson's involvement that in 1937, Five years after the, uh, 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 four years after the Hitler regime had come into power, two years after the Nuremberg Laws, Adolf Hitler granted Thomas Watson a special medal invented for the occasion, a tribute to a foreigner who was given great service to the Third Reich. And he did so in the largest festival and banquet ever held in the city of Berlin. Thomas Watson and IBM knew what they were doing. It was micromanaged. There was an IBM customer site in every concentration camp. You say, what was the name of that site? It was called the Hollerith Abteilung, the Hollerith Department. Where specifically was it lo located? In the Arbeit Einsatz, the Labor Assignment Office. Where specifically, specifically? Dachau, across from the main gate. Mauthausen, across from the plaza, from the, from the parade plaza. In fact, one of the reasons you never find any information, no one found out any information about this was because it wasn't anywhere in the Nuremberg trials. Now that's interesting. Guess who organized all the evidence in translations for every single document in the Nuremberg trials? That was IBM. But they forgot one. One document they forgot. Anyone on the, inter on the internet can find it now. Just type in Mauthausen, that's a concentration camp, and Hollerith, and you'll see the testimony of the guy, of the French prisoner, Viet, who says, um, uh, I was running the Hollerith machines and all the prisoners were coming and going. I know that there is an effort now to reinvent Thomas Watson as the progenitor of a uh, cute little game show computer called Watson. And to celebrate the 100th year anniversary of this company as just the solutions company, they are the solutions company. But I believe that this is not the material of a game show. This is the material of war crimes. And I believe that Thomas J. Watson and IBM were engaged in genocide. And when I say genocide, I don't mean just to use the bad word. I mean legally. And so I've got here with me the law on genocide, which anyone can find on the internet. And I uh, give you Article 2. You're from where? From London? What's your name? Howard Morris. Okay. Would you read Article 2, Defining Genocide, please? 
In the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial or religious group as such, a. Killing members of the group, b. Causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, c. Deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, d. Imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, and e. Forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Okay, that's what genocide is. Now I'm going to ask this gentleman to read what acts constitute punishable genocide. Please read the next article, Article 3. The following acts shall be punishable. A. Genocide. B. Conspiracy to commit genocide. C. Direct and public incitement to commit genocide. D. Attempt to commit genocide. And E. Complicity in genocide. Did you say complicity in genocide? I did. Now, let's see what types of people can be held to account for this act. As you all know, the Nuremberg trials not only went after men who pulled triggers, but after propagandists, diplomats, doctors, bankers. I now ask this gentleman, what's your name? Richard Harrows. And where are you from? New York. New York. What types of people in Article 4 are subject to punishment for these crimes? Persons committing genocide or any other any of the other acts enumerated in Article 3 shall be punished whether they are constitutionally responsible rulers, public officials, or private individuals. Whether they're private individuals or the rulers of nations under the Genocide Treaty, they shall be guilty and punishable for genocide. And that was Thomas Watson, and that was IBM. Now, is there anybody in this room, and I know I got a lot of lawyers here, who thinks I can't prove right now, right in front of your eyes, that IBM did everything I'm saying and more. Anybody? Anybody doubt that I can prove this? Do you, do you doubt it? Not based on your presentation, no. Would anyone like to see some proof to hold in your hands? Who, who, raise your hand if you want to see some proof. Okay, proof you got. And now you'll know why, in the last 10 years, IBM has never answered a word on the information in my book. Why silence has been their defense. Expanded edition of IBM and the Holocaust. Okay. Here's how it looked. Whenever IBM all these programs were custom-made programs. There was no off-the-shelf machine or punch card system. Do you understand? Some of them had double 20. Some of them had 10 holes like the Auschwitz, car, the Auschwitz train cards. Some had 20. Um, I will hold, hold, hold it, Shlomo. Um, and for each one, a special card was made. And they started with a mock-up just like they would do today. They would write one out by hand. What is your name? David. Dave, David from where? Uh, Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim, good. Uh, now, here are some samples. They're handwritten. This is the extermination by labor. And you see that uh, on this one, first of all, you see the proud trademark up on top there, Deutsche Hollerith Maschine Gesellschaft, correct? And that means the uh, IBM company in Germany, the German Hollerith Machine Company. And in this, 
it gives the identity, there are columns to be written into that say Hungarian, Italian, et cetera, et cetera, right? right. With hand marked stuff uh, for, to be added or subtracted in various columns. And then, of course, you put that against the types of professions that they wanted, whether they wanted a, uh, uh, um, an auto mechanic or a bricklayer or a farmer. And there you have the makings of an IBM project. And it started out, as you can see, as a handwritten sketch. And it finished as a custom marked, as a custom printed punch card. Here is one for the SS which was the SS race office, and it's Rassenamt. Do you, do you see it? And what is the proud name of the trademark up on top? If you, say it again. Deutsche Hallerith Gesellschaft. This is the project by project activities of IBM. There wasn't three wasn't 300. There were endless numbers of card permutations. And if they ever would just stop printing the cards, the cards could only be used once. And once they were used, they were like spent bullets. There was nothing left of them because the end product was not a wound or a bloodlet. It was information. If they ever stopped printing the cards, it'd be like rifles without bullets but they never stopped. In fact, in the middle of the war, they sued another printer for copyright infringement, for patent infringement, just to make sure that they wouldn't lose any of the punch card business. What did IBM know? Well, IBM, Every time we run something about what IBM did, we always tend to run what the New York Times was running the next day. If they were located in Cleveland, we would do the Cleveland Plain Dealer. If they were in Baltimore, we would do the Baltimore Sun. But they were in New York, so we ran the New York Times. Now this is the 1937 edition, shortly after, the, um, shortly after uh, um, World War II had started with the invasion, with the Blitz, with the Blitzkrieg. Uh, which, as you know, was powered by the Blitz truck made by General Motors, but that's a different book that I wrote. Now, here is the 19... Uh, what is the date here on this New York Times edition? Right there. September 13th? Yes, 1939. And, um, Aliza, I can't walk too far, come over here. What is the headline here? Nazis hint purge of Jews in Poland. Okay, Nazis hint purge of Jews in Poland. And can you read me what the subhead is? This one here. Three million population involved, removal from Europe via the benefits. They're gonna remove three million people from, from Poland. Now, all this stuff was public. Why was it public? Because they had an entire genocidal ministry devoted to publicizing this stuff. A guy called Josef Goebbels was the minister of propaganda. He loved this stuff. Now, this is the 19, September 13, 1939 uh, edition of the New York Times that says they're going to throw three million Jews out of Poland. And now, let's go to this line in the story. What does that say? How? However, the removal of Jews from Poland without their extermination can halt the alleged strengthening of Western Jewry is not explained. Did you say extermination? I did. And that's in September of 1939. Now, let's go to... the IBM correspondence, company correspondence. Let me explain something to you folks. All these contracts and all these agreements and all these deals were done orally, so they couldn't be tracked. No documents, no signature lines.
But the Nazis didn't trust Watson, so they kept tremendous memos. And I got them. Now, here is a letter. And the letterhead is, can you read the letterhead? Deutsche Hollerith Machine Gesellschaft. That's the Hollerith, the Hollerith subsidiary in Germany. What's the date? September 9, 1939. Okay. Now, Mr. Morris, who is this letter addressed to? Uh, Mr. Thomas J. Watson. Where? Uh, Madison Avenue, New York. Madison Avenue, New York. What's the date again? September 9, 1939. And you will recall that we were just talking about what was in the New York Times. Okay, now what this document says is you will understand, I will read it, that under today's conditions, they've got the Jews in ghettos already, uh, we need um, certain machines which we don't have. And what were they? The advanced alphabetizers. They needed to be able to go Cone, David, Edgar, okay, A, B, C, D, not just by number. And it says here that in addition to that, we're now opening a school for foreign customers just in Berlin. It says, you remember, you will read this, Mr. Morris, you'll verify what I'm saying. You made us an offer orally, my dear Watson, that you would give us these machines, and undoubtedly this will be greatly appreciated in many especially re responsible circles, meaning the Nazi party will be very, very grateful. That's the letter. Here is a memo about the telephone conversation that was had the next day. And it says, yesterday morning, Mr. Schott, that's one of your managers, telephoned once more and informed that obviously pleased that he had again spoken with in America, namely with who? Mr. Watson. Mr. Oxbury. One of his vice presidents it has been developed that America had been under mistaken impression and that they are giving the alpha, alphabetizer machines and you will see the serial numbers of those machines. Yes, This is why IBM says nothing. I got the memos. So when they say, well, we just didn't know what was happening, they knew what was happening. Here's another memo. And your name, sir? <coughs> Cronish. Mike Cronish. From where? New Jersey. Okay. What is the date on this letter? October 10th, 1941. And who's it addressed to? Mr. H.K. Chauncey's Office of the Secretary, Treasurer, International Business Machines Corp. Where? 500 Madison Avenue, New York. Dear Mr. Chauncey. All right, this is the top lawyer for IBM, Mr. Chauncey. And it says here, it's a large letter, correct? It's got about uh, five or 10 pages on, right? Correct. All right, in one of those sections, it says here, <clears throat> the headline? Machines blocked in Poland, Romanian census. They informed the IBM head, head, headquarters in New York that they had to move 16 machines blocked in Poland, which was under war conditions, out to Romania. So they could do the Romanian census, which led to one of the most vicious genocidal actions in the entire Holocaust. So vicious that Eichmann had to fly in and say, you're going too fast. And IBM got him that information. And who was it that helped him get that information? Well, that was the commercial attaché from the American embassy in Berlin in 1939. There's the proof. And here's a letter from the next day. And it says here, who is, who is this addressed to? Mr. Thomas J. Watson, President. What's the date? October 9th, 1941. And what is the logo up on the letterhead? International Business Machines Corporation. 
And does it not say, re read the final line. On the occasion of my visit to Berlin, I also settled a few pending matters, such as the machines blocked in Poland, the Romanian census, the bull patents, and other minor subjects on which I'm addressing separate reports to the executive concerned in New York. Got him. So voluminous was the IBM business that had their own section of the war ministry. Anybody speak German in the room? You speak German, sir? Abyss, okay, Bishon, good. What is, your, what is your name, please? Ruben. Ruben, from where are you? New York. New York. What does that big word on the top there say? Vertrag. Vertrag is a contract. It's a contract. Good. Now, what is the date right there? July 1, 42. July 1, 1942. World War I started in 1939. We got in right after Pearl Harbor in December of 1941. 1942, we're in the war. Now, what is the name of the German organization that is making this, con this contract? It's right there. It's between the... Machinellis. Machinellis, Berichtswesen, das Reich Ministers für Bewaffnung und Munitions. It's the Reich Munitions Bureau. They got their own subsection called the Punch Card Agency. Now, here's the Nazi con contract. Here's the 1942 date. What is the name of the contracting party? International Business Machines Corporation in New York. Where? New York. 1942. Interesting document I published in this book, which includes the punch card that IBM custom crafted for Eichmann's statistician. So 1941 State Department memo, just about at the same time as these letters, and it said that this guy Chauncey just came into the State Department, it's just days before Pearl Harbor, and expressed the fear that one day Germ I IBM may be blamed for helping Germany. It's right in here. And here's one from the Justice Department. You can't see it now. But it's a Justice Department memo that says IBM, what the Nazis have done to us, IBM has done to us. They are an international monster. That, the guy who wrote that got nowhere. 1941. By the way, in case anyone likes to say that IBM didn't know that there were lots of Nazis hanging around its, uh, its machinery. Would you hold this? Here are reproductions of IBM com company booklets sent to New York with all the Nazi newspapers celebrating, I mean, Volkischer, Beobachter, etc., celebrating their involvement in the Third Reich. Hold this. And so we go with the IBM concentration camp codes. These were the codes that IBM created 
to organize the concentration camps. See, they were organized on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. Millions of people from all religions and all nationalities and all characteristics came in and out of thousands of concentration camps and sub-camps throughout Europe. But the one-day capacity of all concentration camps put together was only 275,000. Now that's traffic management. So let's look at these codes. Mr. Morris. This is the original Third Army document, which is reproduced in the book. This is the translation, and you'll see that uh, the type of organization that has arrested the prisoner is marked in this section. And Gestapo is what number? Gestapo was one, number one. And Kripo, meaning criminal police, was what number? Number two. Number two. You have a typical prisoner card here, handwritten. There's nothing about it that shows that there's a punch card about it until it was punched in. The Bundesarchiv said to me, we have 60,000 of these, Mr. Black. There's no punch card to look at. But I knew that this was incriminating because there were not felders, there were boxes, and there were numbers everywhere. And I look here, it says Hallerith Vermerch, Zuab, coming and going, the Hallerith number. And here it says Verschlüsselt, which means keyed in. And there's operator number seven, excuse me, it says Lochkart geproofed, punch card verified. Okay? Now, did you say Kripo was what, number two? Number two. And what, Shlomo, is the number of this man who's been arrested? Kripo. Zero two. Now, let's see the, camp, the major camps. Uh, you'll see them here. The first, one is, um, uh, the first one is Auschwitz. What is Auschwitz's number? 001. And what is the next one? Buchenwald. What number? 002. And what's the third one? Dachau. What number? 003. Shlomo, what is the camp that this guy is being sent to? Three. What's the name of that camp? Dachau. What did you say the number was here? Three. Okay, now, they know, what the camp, they know who arrested the guy, they know the name of the camp the guy is going to. Let's talk about the type of person that they're keeping track of. I will help you here, Mr. Morris, but you can help me out. And uh, type number two is Bible Forsher is Jehovah's Witness. Type number three, what is that? Uh. That's homosexual. Homosexual is a three, and uh, a 12 is a zygunner. It's a gypsy. And what is code eight? Code eight, Juden. Juden, meaning Jew, correct? Okay, so now we know that IBM has got that figured out. What's the next thing that IBM is going to figure out for the Nazis? Status of the prisoner. Excuse me. Status of the prisoner. Here you go. Number one, entlassen, meaning released. Number two, überstellen, transferred. Number three, gestorben, meaning death by natural causes. What is number four? Executed. And number five is freitod, which means suicide. And number six, Zanderbehandlung, gas chamber. That means that an IBM engineer had to differentiate, had to create a system that differentiated between a Jew who was worked to death, who was executed with a bullet to the back of the head, who committed suicide because he couldn't go on, and one who was sent six, 16 per box in, from the barracks into the gas chambers. And this is why IBM says nothing. And tomorrow morning, my friends, the JLJ will not get a letter from an IBM attorney saying we object that you have insinuated that we were involved in genocide. They will not get that letter. They will never get that letter. How do we know when the holler system was involved, when it's, when it's just typing? Well, it always has the Hollerith list.
attached to the, to the document. Now here's a document from Ravenswood and Flossenburg camps. Do you see it? Yes, sir. And what is your name? Maryland. And where are you from, Maryland? Forest Hills. Forest Hills, okay. So um, it says here that on November 13th of 1944, they're transferring four people on one Hollerith list. Do you see it? Correct. Four people on one Hollerith list. And here's another one where they're transferring how, how many cards? 2,324. And the name of the document that is being used to control them? The Hollerith. Uber list. It means the Hollerith trans transfer list. And uh, this is going to the concentration camp of Ravensbrück. And it shows their distribution to all these sub camps, 561 to uh, Zurablau, um, Nurablau, 887 to Zwadau, Graslitz got 150, et cetera, et cetera. Then they've got one, two, three, four, five, six individuals. There's their name, there's their number, they've escaped, and they're going to be eliminated from the list if they're not caught because the Nazis always wanted to know how many Jews were in their custody. And on every document, the proud stamp of the IBM office was placed. Hollerith or Faust. I'll show you some examples. Here's Mauthausen. There's a typed list. Do you not see it? It's typed. These are deathless. And you, you, you see they've got names and they've got numbers. And it's all just typed out. But do you not see a handwritten note at the top? Hollerith. Hollerith. And do you not see a formal stamp at the bottom? Hollerith. Hollerith or Fust, registered, registered by the Hollerith system. Now here's another document, and how many people are, 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 are involved? You can't see words. Two. Two, right. And what's the stamp at the bottom? The Hollerith or Fust. Or Fust, registered by Hollerith. And there in handwriting it says, cards unter Nehmen. the cards have been taken. Here's a list of six people. What does that stamp say? The Hollerith. And what about this one? Handwritten, typed written, stamped with the official proud stamp to show it was an IBM process. And to truncate this conversation so I can take plenty of questions, here's a letter. What's the date of that letter, Mr. Morris? Uh, 4th of July, 1945. 4th of July, 1945. July 4th, 1945, the war is over. And what is the letterhead of that letter? Deutsche Hollerich Maschinengesellschaft. And who was this letter addressed to in 1945? Thomas Watson of the IBM. Where? New York. This letter says, and you can read along with me, I'm sure that all the interests of the IBM were in good hands. The dollar rentals were transferred to the account of IBM in Geneva after the beginning of the war in, with the U.S. and all the rentals were converted by a rate of exchange of 20, 25 um, Czechoslovakian kroners to the dollar and stored on a blocked account in Prague. It says here in the next graph, accordance in accordance with the impossibility to get machines from IBM in 1940, I met with 19, in 1942 with Mr. Chauncey, the attorney from IBM, in Berlin in 1942. An agreement was made where we were authorized to buy the machines from the German unit and re-tag them and sell them in our own name and thereby pay a tax to the IBM. Yes, that's treason. It's not a game show. That's treason. Now there's lots more that I could show you.
And now you understand why this new expanded edition is not just 600 pages of four-point text, but actual illustrations. In fact, I remember when IBM said, we were never in Auschwitz. You cannot prove that we were in Auschwitz. So what did I do? Hold this. I have in here page 50 of the Auschwitz phone book. I have their phone number and the two guys who ran the office. Why, you're saying, why, why, why? How could IBM do this? Why did they do it? Ford, he hated the Jews. General Motors, the president was an anti-Semite, worshiped the Nazis. Why did IBM do this? It was never about the anti-Semitism. It was never about the Nazism. It was always about the money. What was the middle name of this company? D. Standing for? Uh, business. Business. It was always about the business. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Now I'm going to take some questions. Before I take questions, Elisa, do you have a, a, a copy of a book? Just a minute. We have a special. I realize we've run out of time, but we're going to take our time anyway. As long as Ustream doesn't cut us off. Okay, now I have here in my hand, even though you've seen me open up the first box, I happen to have the very first physical edition ever printed. Okay, and I have a letter here from the vice president or the plant manager attesting to the fact that this was sequestered from the print run as the very first copy printed. And this copy goes to Nat Lewin. <laughs> who, who, who just took the microphone. Thank you very much, Edwin. That's an amazingly powerful story, strong evidence. That, uh, and, and I must say, when you talked about September of 1939, you have to realize in September of 1939, that date that you recited, I was, my parents were fleeing with me from Lutz, Poland, huh. uh, through, the, through the woods across the border into Lithuania. I was three years old, and I could very well have been one of your punch cards, if yes. not for, for the grace of God, and that brought, really brought me here. Thank you very I, thank much. Thank you very much, Edwin. Thank you. Love you. Well, the punch cards are deadly accurate, but not deadly enough because the Jews survived. So let's take some questions from people here. I'll take some questions from around the world. We'll start with this woman. What is your name and where are you from? I'm just from New York. So from New York, just from New York, okay. I just want to say, my name is Maxine. I was just wondering if you found any evidence of the um, business transaction in terms of the financial payment. The financial the payment. payment, okay. Right. The payment that was made by the German government. The payments that were made by the German government for the services, for the services rendered. First of all, they were always kept off the books. IBM had, was a public company. But these foreign transactions, I, the Nazi regime was its number one foreign business. Uh, uh, probably the Japanese were number two with the aircraft industry. It's a different book. I didn't write it yet. But anyway, uh, and they were the number two customer after the United States government, Social Security, uh, anywhere on the planet. But all these financial transactions were kept off the books. Um, after the war was done, 
uh, IBM immediately put in for war reparations uh, so that they could get compensated for all the uh, lost packing and boxes and uh, things of that nature that they lost during bombardments. And the these machines were never sold. These machines were always rented. They were leased. That document I showed you was a lease document. That means they were insured in Connecticut, in, Hartf in Hartford. They knew the location and use of each one, especially since they were under wartime conditions. And uh, the last lease payment was made in 1945 when the Americans went in to, um, uh, went into Berlin and one of the members of the IBM board gave a check and said, this is our last check, give this to Mr. Watson. So this information, uh, this information was uh, always withheld, and one of the reasons it was withheld was because Watson got a 1% commission on all of this. And all his managers were on a, 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 um, a quota system and received bonuses for how much they sold to the Third Reich, which they could put in only after the war was done. So everything was very, very precise. And the company, Deutsche Hallerith Machine Gesellschaft, which was the facilitator of genocide, which like other companies should have been dismantled by the Allies, was never dismantled. They merely changed the name. They didn't even reincorporate. And the new name of the same old company that killed the Jews is IBM Germany. Same company, different name.